it's so many things that come to mind every time uh, I do these different talks. And the one thing that came to mind is I just taught you guys a very important lesson. And that lesson is that of a viral coefficient. Who knows what that means? In any business, even when you're up talking to someone, you meet someone, if you have a viral coefficient over one, you're doing something right, right? A viral coefficient could be simply defined as when you interact with a person or if somebody interacts with your business, they will share it with at least one other person. You think about Facebook, their, vi their viral coefficient in the beginning was stupendous, right? And then it went from zero to, to 60 in like three seconds, right? And before I get into kind of the things I actually kind of sort of prepared, uh, I'll just leave you with one thought. Make sure that whoever you meet this weekend have a viral coefficient more than one, right? They want to leave the room talking about you, what you care about, what you want to do, because that's true impact, right? So I'm originally from Chicago, uh, as he said, uh, on the south side. Wasn't the best place in the world, but it taught you a lot, of, taught me a lot of good things. I uh, went to a college prep boarding school in, in Rome, Georgia, of all places. Uh, called Darlington, which is kind of a feeder school into some of these, these top uh, undergraduate universities. Uh, when I was at Columbia, uh, I got the opportunity uh, to start working at Goldman Sachs as an intern, and I could tell you all about that stuff uh, uh, later. Uh, but the, then I majored in history. Now, people thought it was a dumb thing because I ended up working as an options trader at Goldman Sachs with a history major. So while the other schmucks was in school, right, studying econ, I was studying uh, U.S. history, specifically in the financial services markets, uh, in the Great Depression era. So you can imagine graduating in 2003 and what was going on in the world then. I was actually probably 10 times more prepared than everyone else because I understood what happened in that, in that, in that time period. And then what happened uh, subsequent to that is exactly what, what happened in the Depression era, just not as bad. Uh, but then something happened. You know, I was making a lot of money, had a lot of friends, uh, but it, I just wasn't really fulfilled. And so I took an assessment. Uh, I won't mention the assessment because it's still in the market now, but we're trying to beat them. Uh, and uh, in all fairness, I did call them to partner with my company, but they were just too old and tired. So I said, okay, I got to keep, keep it moving. But anyway, uh, I took this assessment and it really helped me understand the things that I hope uh, that, that our product illuminated for you all. So it helped me to understand you know, what motivates me, uh, what my abilities are, uh, what my personality is like. Because if you think of those things, they are directly tied to performance of whatever you do, right? And kind of the process of the science kind of behind what we do is we say, okay, what is the intersection of those three things? Uh, and then it connects it to a career opportunity. So Better Weekdays is a job matching company at the core, but it comes, it starts off with capturing this key data. So anyways, I took this assessment and I said, you know, this is actually pretty cool and I should go to business school because it seems like what you do when your first career is kind of cool, but you want something more, go get more education. But then I said, uh, that, that risk reward doesn't make too much sense. I make this much, I gotta go somewhere for two years, pay them money, and then come back. I mean, the break even on that trade was like seven years. So I was just like, okay, if I'm gonna go to business school, I gotta take a really big risk first, right? Because if you don't take a big risk, you know, it's hard to do it as you get older and older. So I said, I gotta take a big risk, and so I left the company. Um, I was very good at my job. So I literally called Lloyd Blankfein, who is still the CEO, he was the CEO back then, and I said, Lloyd, I'm leaving the company, right? Big deal. So everybody calls me, convincing me not to go, whatever. But I said, and the first question they ask is, well, where are you going? Because they thought I would have gone to Lehman or Lehman didn't fail yet. And it was a good company back then. Uh, or some of the other competitors said, no, I'm just leaving the industry. I, it just doesn't feel right anymore. Um, it was kind of crazy. I wish it was as dramatic as like when Michael Jordan like quit the Bulls and quit basketball. It wasn't that dramatic. But in my mind it was because uh, it was a significant decision. And when I, when I took this assessment, I got this data. Uh, I said, you know, I want to do something in the emerging markets. I did have an idea, um, and in short, it was basically creating a private equity consulting model where I would not only consult a company and tell them what I think they should do and they pay me a fee, but I would align the interest in actually executing it myself and they give me equity. So that, that was the idea. Long story short, I, I, I recognized an opportunity uh, in Africa that the U.S. had legislation that allowed... Uh, from some, certain countries within Africa to export goods to the U.S. duty-free. And I said, oh, that's actually pretty interesting. And I said, oh, this is, sustainability is really big. This can be a good, a good play. So I put a list of my, my top kind of people in my network outside of financial services. And I started coming up with this idea. And in short, 
what ended up happening was the first person on my list was a name a guy by the name of John Simon. Uh, he ran this company. He runs this company called 1888 Mills, which is a middle market uh, textile manufacturing company. So I was talking to him. I've known him for a long time. And I said, John, it, it seems like it's something here that can be applicable to your company. And he, he says, give me a few days. Let me research it, whatever. And so uh, he called me up the week later. I'm in New York, kind of chilling. You know, Goldman Sachs was just like, well, if you're going to leave, take two months. We'll still pay you. I'm like, OK, <laughs> right? I'm not going to turn down money. I'm still a capitalist, right? So, so and, and through this two-month period, I'm basically getting paid to think. You know, I didn't have to shave anymore. I got my beard out. My hair grew long. I was trying to start wearing my Chuck Taylors, which I still wear to this day. And, uh, and it was a cool time. But John called me back a week later. He says, you should, you should fly to Chicago. I think it's something you should, you'd be interested in. So I flew to Chicago because uh, I was in New York at the time. And literally, we went to dinner. We, had, we were at like Champs, Champs or something like that. And on the back of the napkin, we, after talking, I drew out this model that could potentially work. Long story short, I spent the next six years building this factory in Ghana uh, that makes scrubs that we now sell to Walmart, uh, apparel like uh, culinary apparel that you use like aprons and chef coats that we sell to like Centos, Airmark, so high volume commodity goods. But, and that was cool, it was very, it was awesome. Right, going to Ghana like six, seven times a year, uh, I only knew how to trade and manage risk, so I said, you know, I still need to get some business school education because, you know, I'm trying to, I have all these people's kind of, I got this money to invest in this project, and so I went to Kellogg in the part-time program, uh, so basically, I'm learning things on Tuesday, implementing on Wednesday, which is the way I like to learn uh, uh, by doing, but at least with some framework and some structure. And now, to this day, uh, the, the company still exists. Uh, we have about 550 employees in Ghana. I was an executive of 1888 for about six years and ran a $40 million division. Uh, basically, uh, the manufacturing platform was in Ghana, in Pakistan, Bangladesh. And uh, obviously, my little company is a big part of 1888 now. And, uh, and I graduated from Kellogg all, at the same year. I turned 30, graduated from Kellogg, executive 1888. I bought a really fast sports car. I'm like, this is great. This is the best life ever because it was exactly what I wanted to do. Now remember, I started this off by saying that I understood those key things that are directly tied to performance in terms of who I am. And in my case, I applied it to an opportunity. So, like me, when things go well, I'm like, ha, ah, something that's still not right, right? And so with 1888, the thing that wasn't, I wasn't happy about was enterprise control. I like to control my destiny. Uh, and John, John and I had this conversation a lot. We knew this kind of thing, and so, uh, he knew I was kind of thinking about different business ideas. And when I graduated from business school, I now have like 20 hours a week free that I didn't have for the previous two and a half years. The company in Ghana was doing well. We had the Walmart business, so it was just like, well, I don't sell this stuff. I just create it and people do their job. So I have all this free time, so I'm trying to figure out what is that, that next move. And then when I started to reflect, keyword reflection, right, I said, you know, that's actually really cool. I had this job at Goldman in financial services. I then built a company in Ghana, and I'm leaving out a lot of the story. I think the most exciting thing is I'm there, kind of have my, you know, I didn't wear Chuck Taylors in Ghana, but I have my khakis on, my, 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 my golf shirt, and I remember somebody coming to me and said, he would like to meet you, you need to wear a tie. And I'm just like, who the hell are you talking about? You know, I'm just here to build my little factory, leave me alone, you know. And like, uh, the president, his excellency, I'm like, well, I don't need a tie. I really don't wear ties. I, I have a suit, you know, kind of keep it, keep it real. You're like, uh, we'll get you a tie. And so I'm meeting with, like, the president of one of the fastest growing economies of the world, right? So fast forward, when I'm graduating, I'm reflecting on this. I'm like, that's really cool. You go from trading stuff, nobody knows who you are. You know, you can see what you do in the marketplace, that kind of thing, to really having that kind of impact. And that's where the idea came. And the idea was, well, shit, that was a pretty cool experience. Can I share it with other people? And that was what is now Better Weekdays. And so it's very, very simple. Help people to understand those things which are directly tied to performance and then match them to open job opportunities. So we're kind of kicking around the idea, did a startup weekend to talk with some really smart people like Troy Hennikoff, who you guys spoke with yesterday, I believe, and some other folks. And, you know, they kind of critiqued it, but they didn't say my idea sucked. They didn't say you couldn't be the person to execute it. 
It didn't say you couldn't make money. It just kind of talked about like little things that I knew I could fix. And so I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna make a little bit of money so I can focus on this idea. And literally almost a year to the day, I quit my very cushy job, uh, regretted by my very fast sports car, which I still do have to this day. Uh, I might have to sell it, but right now I still have it. Um, and I started pursuing this idea. We got accepted to 1871, um, and we've been, we've been off to the races since. Uh, so that is my story, uh, but let me give you what I think is the most interesting part, and then I'm gonna open up with questions. Nobody really cares about what you do. I'm being real, right? I would sit in Africa. I'm like, look, guys, we want to put up a factory that's going to employ all these people who are literally on the street selling bags of water. They, they are in the informal economy, meaning no health care, no benefits, no anything. We're trying to create jobs. We're funding it. Give us this building, because we're not going to build the building when you have five of them empty. They didn't care. They did not care. Nobody cares about what you do. Never forget that. So then I changed my approach. I was very, very specific in saying why I do what I do. And that is the difference. And so one of the things you've, I've heard some of the speakers and they're talking about personal brand, this kind of, all this kind of stuff, it's all very, very important, right? I don't know about you guys, I think a lot of that stuff is just overwhelming. It's a lot of all this great advice coming at one time, it's just a lot. And so I would encourage you to figure out ways to simplify it, right? And to me, you can either have kind of a push approach and try to say, oh, this is what I'm doing. You hear it all the time. Walk around 1871, everybody would be so happy. Here's my company, this is what it's doing. Sign up, like us on Facebook. Okay. But I never asked you guys to like us on Facebook before you experience what we do and how we do it and why we do it, right? Because now you're hooked. You got some kind of benefit. I specifically said, I pay for every step that you guys take, right? Right? So I'm really serious about this, right? Uh, and then when you understand the why and you see the value, then you start reacting. And it's true in everything, right? If people know wh what you're about and why you do what you do, you will always be thought of. And then all these serendipitous things start to happen. And hopefully with Better Weekdays, what we do is we start to not rely so much on serendipity. We, we create it uh, because people have trusted us to understand the why behind what they do. And then hopefully we can facilitate those connections, not only to jobs, but events, thought leadership, mentors, career coaches, et cetera. So this is a very small start to where we want to go as a company, which is to build kind of a virtual, personalized career services center that will help to facilitate everybody's path along the life cycle. Because let's be real, we're all going to have four, five, six jobs. And if you're very entrepreneurial uh, and have a lot of ideas, you may have something on the side, right? Uh, and so how do you manage that? There's no place to help you manage that, to make, to optimize that decision-making process. And, you know, the connection to all of this and, and my why is I like helping people, right? I like creating the conditions in which people can be helped and doing it in a sustainable, scalable way where they then can help themselves, right? And when you see the impact of all that kind of stuff, it's actually pretty cool. So... That is my story. You understand my why. You understand what I'm doing. You understand how I got here. So I'm going to open it up. Nothing is off base. I'm a very, very open and transparent person. Anything you want to ask, nothing is too personal to me because it's all about brand. And if you're consistent with that, uh, you think good things tend to happen. Okay, great. So a uh, couple things. So he asked a question about the real conditions in, in Bangladesh and Ghana uh, in the textile industry. What textile do you focus on? We did towels and apparel and things like that. What? Okay. 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 Great. Um, and then the question over here was like how to, to grow that, how we grew that business to $40 million. It's a real technical thing. It's, it's a very easy one to answer. Um, and then the question over here was like, would I go back and do it again, making the corporate to entrepreneurial transition? Okay. So I'll do it in reverse order. So the real conditions are, it's an unbelievable opportunity. Uh, innovation happens here, right? And, uh, one of the best things I learned is to be empathetic, to like treat people how they want to be treated, um, and they will help create the conditions in which you can be successful. And so the whole point is the conditions is exactly what you read. It's, it's a lot of infrastructure problems. Uh, there's a lot of people who can work, and if you bring a solution that is a win-win-win, 
even to the people, quite frankly, do have to pay to get things done, uh, they will create the conditions to be successful. Cool? Did I, or, okay. Well, places, that's a big word, right? When you, when you narrow it down, so, so I, let me th answer a different way. So when I decided which, uh, which place you wanted to put the factory, right? I, I went to like six or seven different countries within Africa, right? I was limited because this legislation only was about 26 countries included in it for the duty-free exports. And I went there, I, and like when you talk to a president, you talk to the whole cabinet, when you talk to the people in the street, you understand the letter of the law. You connect with partners who have done a lot of work in that area because I knew nothing about it. So like the Millennium Challenge account, which awarded hundreds of millions of dollars to certain countries within Africa who, who had a certain level um, of, of kind of development. It helped to de-risk the business, uh, which allowed me to then be confident going in with the money that, that we, we received to fund it uh, to, to produce the company, right? Uh, but the whole point is you gotta be very specific to detail, and it's very, very different between like Ghana and like Kenya and like Uganda, right, or Tanzania. Um, I inherited part of that division. Uh, that's what, so part of it was like 20 million bucks. The Ghana uh, facility added a few more million to it. Uh, but the business was a global division, and so it was just growing very, very fast. The strategy was very simple. Go to the largest customers, because this is a commodity business where you make like three cents on everything, right? It was a little bit more than that. But the point is, you got to have a lot of volume. And so for the products that we could make with the core competency of the people on the ground and what we can train them for very quickly, uh, you go to Walmart. <laughs> Walmart breaks and breaks you. You have to be comfortable with the complexity. Uh, but it was the Ghana business was as successful as the global company that supported it. Uh, because there's a lot of complexity in that supply chain management and that kind of stuff that, that was very important. On the question over here about the transition from corporate to, to entrepreneurship and, and would I do it again, look, you know, I'm a black kid from the south side of Chicago. Credibility is important, right? So I'm like, where's the hardest place I can work where if I walk into a room independent of race or whatever, they will not question my intelligence. That was one. Number two was like, where can I go where I can control my future? I was an athlete, I still am sort of an athlete. You know, I got my entrepreneurship 20, but <laughs> <so> <laughs> get your manager expectations, right? But, uh, but it's like, where, where can I go to, uh, uh, that when I, when I left, I can leverage that and springboard to any kind of job that I want. So uh, my strategy was, I was very clear on why I made that decision and what I would be afforded, right? So now I have a lot of rich friends with Ferraris and I have to convince them not to invest in that stuff and invest in things like Better Weekdays. Um, I have a very strong appreciation for, for very complex markets and I wouldn't be able to be building algorithms for matching with the jobs if I didn't have that experience of, of you know, managing billions of dollars of risk in the, in the commodities portfolio uh, at the firm. So I would totally, totally do it exactly the same way. I, I don't really have any regrets because there's lessons in everything. Uh, I th again, it's kind of being very clear on why you do what you want to do. Um, another kind of way of simplifying all of this, because it's a lot of stuff that you're going to hear over the course of the weekend. You know, uh, I don't know if it's Stephen Covey or Franklin Covey, whichever one is the oldest, but one of the things he talked about in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is kind of begin with the end in mind, right? And so if you say, and I've, see, I've read, you know, not all of them, but a lot of these different big dreams, if that truly is your end goal, okay, work backwards, and the question I ask myself, my team, and running a company, I've always done this, is what has to be true for you to be successful, right? So what has to be true to be successful as an entrepreneur, what, and, and success is defined individually, right? And, and to get funding or to be able to build a team and things like that is that I have to have unparalleled integrity, credibility, things like that, and I knew that, and so you make decisions that are consistent with that and how you build that brand so that when you have the opportunity to kind of build something special, you basically along the way built your fan base who's gonna support you, right? Does that make sense? All right. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, the downside of being matched to a bad person in a date, you just date somebody else, right? The downside of being matched to a bad job is a little bit more complicated. So I'll answer that question she asked about algorithms and matching. Uh, 
Whoa, okay, I won't take any more. Uh, that, that's, that's good. Okay, so, so the first one was about like uh, the algorithms and matching and things like that. So this is, a, this is actually a very important lesson, you guys. I spent a lot of time to tell you something I could tell you in like two minutes, right? So I can bet anybody with a very simple algorithm that is built in my head right now uh, that I will beat you betting on football games any season, any time period, anywhere, right? And the question is why? And the answer is very, very simple. Because you can have a team of experts every Sunday that says who's going to win the game on Monday, whatever it is, right? And one stat is more true than any complex algorithm, and it is the home team wins 60% of the time, right? So you can have any Hall of Famer football player on these different talk shows on Sunday morning about who's going to win the game in the afternoon, and 60% of the time with a very simple algorithm that the home team wins, you, you, you'll do okay, right? So the point is, to your question, is that it's not that complex, right? And, and it actually, I can relate it to dating in a very simple way. And I, this is very personal. Everybody can disagree or agree, but this is what I do. We'll see how, how it works out for me. But to me, you know, there's no such thing as like the eighth most important thing, right? If it's number eight, it ain't that damn important, right? So, so, so what are the, like the key important things and just stay focused on that, right? So in relationships, are her values aligned to mine? Is she fun? Does she commit herself to personal growth? Does she appreciate my own path and want to add and contribute to my vision? If those four, that's my personal dating algorithm. And it's very easy. I can go into a club, meet some model girl. I'm like, you're cool. Go through my algorithm. Nope. And move on. <laughs> right? It's, it's like, I mean, and, and you have to do this in life because it gets more complicated as you make decisions, right? So the point is, is that what is that simple rubric, you know, in your mind, right, that you can go through? So, it's, so the point is, even in job matching, let's go back to what you all just took. What motivates you? Because if you have the skill set to be a trader in Goldman Sachs, if you're not motivated by that opportunity, you won't do well. What's your skills, right? If you're not a nuclear physicist, you probably don't want to have a job building bombs, right? And what's your personality? If your personality is not conducive to the environment in which you have to perform, you're not going to do well. So in our algorithm, it's very obvious. We take those three things, the intersection of those things, and we combine it to a competency model that's attached to what needs to be good in, in certain jobs, company culture, et cetera. Cool? Not key, no, you just went through the assessment. It's not keywords. It's a, it's a, it's a career intelligent algorithm, right? You answer 500 questions. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's built in a way where you can't game it, right? And so, you know, you do keywords if you have like resumes and things like that. She asked if it was keyword matching. We try to get beyond the resume to things that actually matter to you. And that's why we say bring who you are to what you do. Cool? And if you want to work with us, you seem very interested. Just talk to me after. We're always hiring. Uh, the question about the advice, the, the most important advice in the 20s, um, I think it's the most important advice of all time, personally. I didn't come up with it. I don't know where I got it, but, you know, it's the age of digital, the digital age. So everybody just copies and whatever. So I'm plagiarizing. I just know who from. But the advice that I've always gotten, and I've always tried to stay true to it, if you are genuine and you are prepared, you will be successful. It's, it's really that simple, right? Uh, and everything you probably heard this weekend can be pretty much, here's another way you can kind of make decisions, right? You can pretty much put under that, that umbrella, right? Um, I am, and it's, it's really that simple because if people feel that you're being authentic and real with them uh, and, and you prepare for that conversation, right? So I'd be a perfect Goldman Sachs example, right? People always say, how the hell at 20 years old did you meet Lloyd Blankfein, right? I'm like, first of all, you're just a guy, right? But it was a method to my madness. It's no different from being in the consulting firm, right? Which is, I talked to the summer analyst, asked him or her questions that I wanted to know. And then I went to the first year analyst on the desk, asked him a modified version of the question using the information I got from the first guy. And you can imagine this. So I have my one time in a setting like this, Lloyd Blankfein's giving a talk and it says questions. Nobody wants to ask questions to Lloyd Blankfein. <laughs> Youngest guy in the room, hand goes up, I will never forget this. Gary Cohn, who's the number two guy at the firm, was also in this, in this panel. And my question was, I said, you know, this is a pretty large firm. What are the red flags in how you manage your risk where you know where to put your attention to? It seemed like a very simple question to me, but that question was the golden question. To this day, Gary's like, I still remember your red flags question. And obviously, you think about what's happened in the last 10 years. It's extremely important, right? 
But that was the result of not my genius, <laughs> right? It was just working up the chain to answer those questions and it goes to the point of being prepared, right, for, for the situations. Uh, if I was to add a third point to that, which I think is something that I learned recently because empathy is my weakness, uh, think about it, right? I'm a trader at Goldman Sachs, right? Like, and I, I'll never forget, this, this, this bright-eyed person comes to the desk, I had lost like a million bucks, and it's like two o'clock, the market's not closed, I'm trying to manage this risk, I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna tell my boss I lost a million dollars. And they look at me, so, what are you, what are you thinking right now? <laughs> and I, it's, it's what I call the ice grill. <laughs> so I look at him, and I'm like, can you give me some coffee? Black. It was that, and, 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 and to be even more candid, one of the biggest reasons why I left the firm, I didn't like the person I was becoming. I was becoming an asshole, right? And I was like, oh, my mom didn't raise no asshole. I gotta make, make a better decision. Uh, and use the money that I made and invest in something that, that I think could be more impactful. So, uh, so the first two is be genuine and be prepared. And then the last one is really be empathetic. And it's very true in everything. You know, everything you see and how we created our product at Better Weekdays, everything that we will create, hopefully if we're around, it's all because of people like you who give me feedback. You'll get emails from me. You probably got an email from me last night, <laughs> right? I know I sent one out. I don't know if you guys opened it yet. Um, but, but that empathy thing is key, and it goes back to what I was saying to the guy in the textile industry, right? You, you have to, it's like they call it the platinum rule, right? The golden rule is treat people how you want to be treated. That's very, very selfish, right? The platinum rule is treat people how they want to be treated, right? Um, so it's like you wear a tie to the president, see the president. Not like, I don't wear ties, I'm cool, you know? But it's kind of that thing, and not even to be flippant. That empathy thing is, is probably one of the most important things. And the reason why, if you practice kind of a, a if you focus on that empathy part, people will just tell you their problems. That's all I want to know. As an entrepreneur, they'll tell you their problems. And all your job is to figure out the solution that best solves that problem. And it doesn't matter if you're a corporate, right, or if you are an entrepreneur. You have to have an entrepreneurial mindset because here is a fact. You will have the average employment is like four years, right? 4.2 years. And that, that's actually pulled up by people who are like 40 and 50 and stay in their jobs a little bit longer. So it's less than 4.2 years. That's number one. Number two, most startups fail. So even if you have great business ideas, and I'm sure you all will be successful eventually, but you might fail. We may fail. That's okay. I did it, right? Because also I know what has to be true to get funding from VC guys. Have you done this before? Yes, I did, right? So, so my downside isn't that much, right? And if you have a corporate experience, I didn't forget how to trade, right? I'm like, yep, that started thing to work out. Lloyd, I'm coming back, right? You got a job for me, right? So, uh, so th those would be like the biggest lessons. All right, so I think I have like five minutes left. Is that right? Something around there? Five? All right. So really good question. Ask some hard stuff. I mean, I, this, is, this is the most customized thing you can do. What is it? Carefully. How did you go about building your team and what skill sets do they possess? So I build it carefully. Uh, I know it's a phonetic thing. She almost said better work days. And I know that people do that all the time. So I own that URL too uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a language thing. But I can't change it from better week days because, you know, it's like you know, I was in the bar one time. I mean, it's a quick story. It's a quick story. It's, I love the story. So the name of the company used to be Better Mondays, you know, case of the Mondays kind of thing. And we did our research and there was a trademark on Better Mondays by a company which is now bankrupt, uh, but they never used the name, but I was like, oh, I was bummed out, bummed out. And I'm, in the, I'm at the bar, smoking hookah, uh, drinking some drinks. And I said, I just wanted people to have better, and it came to me, right? And then, you know, I went home, did the whole trademark search, whatever, so that's how the Better Week Days happened. I just, I just love that story. It's the most creative thing I've ever done and built the logo. That's, after that, my whole team does it. So, how do you build your team? Carefully, I think that is important for the founder. Nobody can sell your baby like you, right? It's, it's, and if you don't do it, how can you teach somebody else to do it? Uh, so it's kind of like uh, figure out where your gaps are. Mine was technology. Uh, I'm not a coder, uh, never wanted to be, right? And uh, so I needed somebody who could at least understand technology. Uh, so the quick story is I was in Startup Weekend in 2011 over the summer. I got accepted to this to, to the program Startup Weekend, and uh, you pitch your idea on like Friday night, you get people to come to you to, to work on your idea over the course of the weekend. One of those guys is a guy by the name of Kunal, uh, who understood technology, couldn't code. I'm like, dude, you went to Georgia Tech, you're an engineer, how can you not code? But 
more than he the more than the fact he understood technology, he believed in the why about what Better Eaters is doing. And so last year, roughly around this time, when I made the decision to quit my job, now good, I made a lot of money. Yeah, my little sports car, I'm like, yeah, you know, I could not work a couple years, I'd be cool. This kid, at the time, is 23 years old. And he said, Chris, I'm not letting you do this by yourself. I'm with you. He believed in the why. So how do I choose it? I would rather have an A player who I can train than a B player who's not committed, right? Uh, so an A player defined by you believe in the why and the vision. So that's kind of how I do it. And, I, and you get a sense of what you need as a business. And, and like Troy said, you know, sort of like a basketball team, right? Uh, if I'm five foot two, right, and I know I'm playing against like Shaq, I probably need somebody to play against Shaq and the world, you know, whoever the big guy, Dwight Howard, somebody like that. Shaq's kind of old. I could probably be Shaq now. But, but, but the point is, is that I, I look for the holes and, and the kind of, in my mind, the framework is, you know, what has to be true for my business to be successful? What do we have to be the best at, right? And again, it can't be eight things, right? It should be narrowed down to the, at, at most three. And where is my gap in achieving that? And then I just go out and, and, and I look for people uh, who possess that, not because it's on their resume, obviously. That's why I don't ask for your resume only to end the process, it's the, it's the assessment. Everybody goes through our assessment. I understand they can be comfortable in an entrepreneurial environment. I understand that they are very strategic in their thinking. So when we have the inevitable conversations, and I'm a very detail-oriented guy, it can be very rough if people don't come prepared, right? And I need somebody who can kind of jive with me like that. And uh, so beyond the skill set, it's looking at are they motivated to do it, right? Are we talked about abilities, and is their personality conducive to the environment at 1871? Our office is on the other side of this wall to kind of to kind of do that. Answer your question. All right, two more questions, and we got to wrap up. I just showed you. So one to many. So I call up Tim. Actually, somebody 18 said, oh, that's actually another good story, right? This is the second to last question, and I'll make it a quick story. So the person who Tim was speaking with in 1871 knows us because I used to sit at the front table every single day and met every single person who came in here, right? So I'm already creating my viral coefficient more than one. You walk in the door of 1871, you will see me in number one, right? So Tim c communicates with Christy. Christy knows the why about what, what Better Week Days does. And she said, you know, this, this group succeeds faster. This may be a good partnership opportunity, right? Tim and I, we didn't, our longest conversation was like in the last like week, right? Because it was very easy. I knew his why, he knew our why, so things happen, right? So Tim, one connection, connects me to 91 people, right? The viral coefficient, for coefficient more than one, right? All of you guys took our assessment. All of you guys, most of you guys, have liked our Facebook page. Right? Ha, huh, you just reminded me of something. I will give someone 200 bucks and my mentorship, which I think is pretty cool, for who can get the most of their friends to like our Facebook page over the next week. You all get an email, so I have your email addresses, right? And you have to send me a screenshot like Facebook does that says how many of your friends like Facebook, right? And you will get a $200 value prize. It's two places, first and second place. I don't know what the second prize is gonna be, but it's all about value, and it won't just be money, it'll be about value. I don't care about value, right? So, another example. I just presented something, which is true, this is not a joke, I'm dead serious, right? Of a viral coefficient that could be more than one. So from one connection, 1871, the person who Tim talked to, I now have access to probably roughly, the math works out to about 2,000 people, right? And so that's the kind of stuff we do in our company. Uh, it's, it gets more complicated when you think about how you optimize your website for certain things and share features and things like that. But it goes back to the advice. If you are genuine and you are prepared and you are empathetic, people will want you to be successful, right? If we fail, it ain't gonna be because we're stupid, right? We're gonna fail because if we, if we fail, it's gonna be because we don't execute well or because somebody outcompetes us, something like that. And hopefully that won't happen, right? But did that answer your question about the viral coefficient? All right, last question. Ooh, the general or lieutenant colonel. You're, you're general to me right now. <laughs> when a guy in a uniform like that is like, hey, a question for you. You know, you're like, whatever you want. Uh, what, what, what keeps me up at night? Um, I don't like to fail. Even though there's value in failure and things like that, I, I don't like to fail. Uh, and specifically, 
and this is actually going to answer a few other questions you probably have. You know, in entrepreneurship and in anything in life, you know, you have an idea, right? And you have to have a process to validate that that idea is actually an opportunity. And, and it's a whole process you go about, that entrepreneurial process, Troy talked about it yesterday, that helps to validate it being an opportunity. Specifically in our business, we have validated, I would call, eight of seven of the nine building blocks of business. It's a great book called Business Model Generation, uh, which you can, it gives you a framework of you know, your value propositions, how you create demand, your customer segments, your revenue structure, your key activities, your partners, your key resources, and your cost structure, right? Um, and, and, it, and, and in those areas, that's that framework. Business Model Generation is a book. It's fantastic. And you, and you read it in conjunction with the Lean Startup, which Troy mentioned yesterday. In our business specifically, we have validated one of the most important things, which is how do we bring talented people into our system that we can facilitate the job matching process, right? So it's one to many. Find people who have the same why. You all take in our assessment. You can opt in right now on our site to match you a job. And now I have 91 opportunities to provide value to companies for, we, for us to make money or doing something we care about. What keeps me up at night is now that I've validated seven of those things in that business model is I now have thousands of people in our database after like four months, right? I need to have thousands of jobs in my system at the exact same time so we can deliver value for people who really want to have a job. And I have to map or connect that data to all the data that I've collected on you guys from going through the assessment. That is from a business perspective that thing keeps me up at night. And the second thing, and maybe you all can help me, we are fundraising. And, and so at the end of the day, you know, when you validate that you can kind of have the jobs mapped to the, to the data, uh, making sure that you have the resources uh, where you can bring your product to bear. Uh, that was a great, great question. And, uh, and actually, because of these things that keep me up at night, that's why I will not be with you for the most of the day today. So I apologize in advance because I think it's very valuable stuff you guys are getting. Uh, all I have to say, again, if it's three things you take away from this conversation, right, I hope you take away that Better Week Dates is great and Chris is kind of awesome, but uh, be genuine, be authentic. It is the most important thing. In, in, a, in a time where it's just so much noise, you, we all as individuals have to find a way to, to recognize those signals, right? Who is that person you should date? Who is that person you should marry? Who is that company or business partner you should work with, right? authenticity will help bring more authentic people to you. Trust me, right? It, just trust me, right? Be prepared, right? Somebody says, oh, I want to learn a lot about entrepreneurship, right? And I'm like, and I ask them certain questions, and I'm just like, yeah, you got to read a few books first. You got to talk to some other people. Work your way up before you talk to people who, like myself, every minute I have to get a positive ROI, right? Because this shit is real, right? My runway is four months. If shit does not happen in a significant way in four months, better weekdays will not be a better weekday for me, right? I'm being real. Now, now granted, we just made 20 grand revenue yesterday, so I'm happy about that, right? But something's going right, but you got to be, be prepared, right? And, and that's where these frameworks come from that gives you kind of a baseline to be prepared so you can make better decisions. And the last thing is just be empathetic, right? I've stood up here for 40 minutes giving you what I get. It's the best what I have. I'll take everything, right? Like, I could be bankrupt. I made a lot of money at Goldman Sachs. I did. But I bought a fast sports car, bought a home, you know, made sure my mama was good, you know. And so now, the decision I have in my mind, so I don't worry as much about fundraising, is that if my savings went to zero, would I be happy? The answer actually is yes. I won't give up my home. I love my house. I will give up my car, even though I love that too. But I'm like, look, make better day successful, sell your car, and buy a Tesla. I love it, right? But, but, but the point is, is that, 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 that empathy and how you speak to people, because you never know people's situation, how you build your products, how you grow your brand, asking people about themselves and their why, getting them to engage with you, you are just creating your fan base, a real fan base. You don't have to do anything gimmicky, right? So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you guys being here. You all are kick ass and good luck.